Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to read a couple of short things, and I'm very happy to take questions. I often think that you'll get more out of the questions anyway, and uh, I will discover what you actually want to know as opposed to me just talking. Um, uh, Stefan asked me about the origin of my name, so I thought I would, I would address that very quickly because it is, in fact, the question I get asked the most. Uh, it, it is not the question that all of us get asked, which is, where do you get your ideas? Uh, that actually comes second for me, because the question I get asked the most is, is Garth Nix your real name? <laughs> because it sounds like the perfect name for a writer, particularly a writer of fantasy, so everyone always presumes it must be a pseudonym. I must have made it up. Uh, other authors particularly assume it must be assumed because it sounds, it sounds so right. And it's short, it fits very nicely on the books. Um, it uh, is in the middle of the alphabet. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, science of picking pseudonyms. Um, authors like to talk about what pseudonyms they, they will need to adopt at some point in their career uh, or want to adopt. And one of the theories is that you should always, and this is, I guess, an old, an old time theory, really, probably is less relevant now, but you should choose a surname which is roughly in the middle of the alphabet, because when the books are on a bookshelf in a bookstore, and they go from A in the top left corner down to Z in the bottom right, if you're roughly in the middle, you'll be at my height, and uh, your books will be, be more prominent. It doesn't work so well in this, this era of uh, online selling and so on, but Nick's roughly in the middle. Uh, people sh assume it must be a student. But it is, in fact, my real name. It is my real name. My friends claim I was not named after the comic book Garth, uh, I don't know, many of you know that comic, that comic series, which ran in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s in the Daily Mail, I think, in the United Kingdom. But it also did run in the Herald Sun in Melbourne, where I was born. So I'm deeply suspicious <laughs> about my parents' claims that I was not named after Gar, who was a superhero who can travel back in time and has adventures in many, many places. And my family always find it very amusing that the superhero Gar has an enormously muscled body and a very small head. Whereas I'm quite the reverse. I have a very large head and a not so muscled body. Um, so it is my real name. It is the perfect name for a writer of fantasy. I think it's also the perfect name for a writer in general, in part because you can find both my names in the dictionary. So I'm always very pleased about that. Uh, both my names actually have other meanings than not just names. A garth, of course, is a walled garden or a walled courtyard, like the cloister garden of the church. Nix, one of the meanings of Nix is, of course, nothing, which I prefer to ignore. <laughs> you know, Mr. Nothing, hi, garth, nothing here, not so good. But much, much more appropriately for a writer of fantasy, it is also a very old word from Germanic mythology that means a merman or a water sprite. So Nix. I, I actually, I love, the, I love the definition of Britannica, and suck with Britannica the best. It has a really great write-up on Nix's. Britannica.com has it, and so on. Um, and according to myth, a Nix is a creature, half human, half fish, that lives in beautiful underwater palaces, and they're able to assume human form. And typically, they assume the form of an aged crone, a young maiden, or an Australian author. Um, <laughs> and I've always loved that. The, the idea that perhaps long ago, one of these mythological mixes, uh, and, and they only interact with humans in, in kind of two ways, that they don't have a great range of feeling, they only, they only interact in two ways. One is they like to lure humans to death by drowning, not so positive. And the other one is they marry them. It's like one or the other, it's death or marriage. <laughs> not a lot of choice, you can't be friends, it seems. Um, but I like to think maybe a long time ago, there was one of these mythological mixes chose marriage, and maybe I'm descended from a mythological creature as well, so absolutely perfect for a fantasy writer. So that's, that's my name, that's my name in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, I thought I'd read a couple of different little things today. Uh, the first thing I thought I would read, just to give you sort of basis for comparison, uh, is in fact from my very, very first published book. Uh, admittedly self-published book, because here it is. Uh, stories by Garth Nix, and I, uh, I made this little book when I was seven or eight years old, uh, and I wanted to tell stories, and obviously I was also thinking about publishing them. I was, I was a long way ahead of the whole self-publishing thing that goes on now. Um, it was easier back then, of course, you just folded up a piece of paper. Um, so I thought I'd read you a story from stories by Garth Nix, and you can see if I've improved over the years. 
Um, if, if you tell me this is the best thing I've ever written and it's been downhill ever since, I'll be I'll be disappointed. But, um, so this is this is a little story I wrote when I was seven or eight. Um, it is quite long, so settle back, relax, and uh, I'll I'll read it to you. It's called the Coin Shower. A boy went outside. It started raining coins. He picked them up. The end. <laughs> so it's not that long. But um, one of the things I like about this this little story is that it shows that even back when I was seven or eight, I was thinking about the structure of stories. Because that has a very classical story structure. It has a beginning where a character is introduced in a, in a setting. There's a boy who went outside. Then there's a middle where there's a complication. It started raining coins. And then there's the end where I resolve the complication that I've set up. He picked them up. So even back then, obviously, from the books that I've been reading, from the stories I've been reading, I was instinctively absorbing the structured stories. Um, this isn't the actual, the actual stories by Gartnick's book, by the way, because the real one is in the National Library of Australia. No, not really. Um, no, the real one is, is back home. My younger brother actually found it. Uh, about four years ago, my parents moved. My mother rang me up and said, you've got to come and, and help us pack up, but most of all, you've got to come and take away, who are organized to take away, all your boxes of books that you have underneath their house. And I hadn't lived there for 25 years or possibly longer. I thought, boxes of books under the house. I, I said, well, what are we talking about? Three, because I can remember sort of three or four boxes of books. And my mother said, 21. And I was like, oh, whoa, 21. I wonder what's in there. And then so I went down, and in fact, there were 22 boxes of books that I had to remove. But while we were helping pack up, my younger brother found this little book, or the original of this little book, and he got it out when we were having lunch and, and he started reading some of the stories from it. And I thought that he'd made it just to make fun of me with my brother. And so he was just poking fun at me, you know, you're, you're the author, here's one of your, see some of your early, your early rubbish. But my parents said, no, that actually is, that's a real thing. He, didn't know, he hadn't made it up. Uh, it was a real little book. And they couldn't remember exactly when I, when I made it, but when I, was, when I was seven or eight, something, something like that. So even very early on, I was obviously thinking about being a writer and uh, planning to be published, whether I had to do it myself or not. So that's the coin shower is very early gardenings, and I thought I might read you something now from Clariel, much more recently, of course. Clariel is a return to the Old Kingdom. Uh, it's a return to the setting of Sabriel, Lirel, and Orson, and a couple of the, the long short stories that relate to that world as well. But it's a very different Old Kingdom. Uh, the world of the Old Kingdom in Sabriel, of course, the Old Kingdom is, is shattered and broken. Uh, the, the dead have come back from death all over the place. There are free magic creatures on the rampage. Uh, everything is in big trouble. But in Clariel, it's going back 600 years before the events of Sabriel. And the Old Kingdom is, in fact, very peaceful. It's very settled, it's rich. There's no trouble, no apparent trouble. Because of this, people have largely forgotten. They've forgotten about the danger presented by, by the dead, by the ability of things to come out of death. They've forgotten about free magic creatures. There hasn't been any trouble for such a long time that everyone's got used to being peaceful. And as a consequence of this, the Apostles, the family whose, whose job it is to keep the dead down, to deal with the free magic incursions and so on, have become much less important. People don't think of them as important anymore. Uh, charter magic itself has become something that people are not so interested in because it's hard, it's difficult to learn. So it's something that you get other people to do rather than, than learning it yourself. It's something for service that you pay to do. So it's, it's a different it's a different world. And Clariel is the story of a young woman called Clariel who has grown up in a small town and who is a loner and she's solitary. She loves the forest, she wants to be a hunter. She's 17, her idea of her future is to live by herself in the, in the great forest, perhaps to become a border, one of the people who patrol the forests and, and make sure that uh, all, all is well, but still essentially a solitary occupation. But she's forced to move to the capital city, Belisair, by her parents. Her mother, Jaisil, is a goldsmith, a very, very talented goldsmith who was given the opportunity to join the High Guild of Goldsmiths in Belisair, the capital city. And in fact, there's a very nice new map of, uh, of Belisair in Clarel. Um, 
it's always nice to have a new map in any in any fantasy novel. Uh, this this one actually has the old maps as well, so it has three maps. Like any fantasy novel with three maps, it must be three times as good as one with only one map, and possibly thirty times as good as one with no maps. Uh, that probably doesn't really work, but it's a very nice new map. So she comes to to, to she's forced to go to Belisere with her parents. Her mother makes her, her go. She hasn't been in the city very long before she realises that she has to escape. She has to get out. She feels crammed in by the walls, the people. She's disconnected from the life she really, really wants to lead. And so she decides she'll do whatever is necessary to, to escape the city, get away from her parents. And her parents are, are powerful. Her, her mother is a cousin of the king, as well as being high in the goldsmith's guild. And she's also the daughter of the current at Orson. Clariel is the granddaughter of the current of Orson, but they are estranged from the Orson family for reasons that become clear in the story. So Clariel has a lot arrayed against her. Her parents have particular plans for her. They all involve being stuck in the city, surrounded by stone. She can't get out under the sky. And she decides to do whatever it takes to get out. And one of the opportunities that presents itself to her is that if she can help a small group of people do something, they will help her. And what this group of people wants her to do is to help them trap what they think is a free magic creature. They think there's a free magic creature on a little island just outside the city, which is getting into the city. I want to know what it's up to. This is a small group that they're among the few people who are actually concerned about such things in this current era. So Sabre, I think Sabre, I've been, on, I've been on the road for a month. I'm getting a bit tired, obviously. Um, if I start talking absolute rubbish, I'm sure I'll be sort of taken away <laughs> and uh, the wet cloths will be applied to I make sense again. Clariel um, agrees to help them, not really fully understanding what she's doing. They think that because she's the Borson's granddaughter, uh, and the Borson's are very deeply connected with the Charter of Free Magic, uh, that she will be, she can be used like a kind of tethered goat to draw the Free Magic creature out, which is of course a much, much more dangerous thing than she, she really knows. I'm going to read a little passage here where she's gone with this group of people to this little rocky islet to try and lure out this free magic creature. And of course, things don't go exactly as planned. So I'm going to read a little sequence here. Lady Clariel, a human shout, followed by the rush of footsteps on stone. Robin came charging up the steps, sword in hand, silver fire leaping along the blade. At the same time, something else rose up out of the very rock, almost under Clariel's feet. At night, from a distance, it might be confused for a woman, for it was vaguely feminine in shape. But this close, it could be seen that the slender legs ended not in feet, but narrowed to become sharp, bony blades, the colour of yellow teeth. Its arms had two elbows, a hand's breadth apart, and its spade-like hands had too many fingers, each ending in a curved back claw. Its hair was not hair, but a mass of brilliant tendrils of white light that flowed around its head and cascaded down its shoulders and back. And its face, if it had one, was an absence of light in the middle, a dark, oval void without features of any kind. Below its shining head, its skin was entirely the colour of old, dried blood. Claws raked at Roven. He parried, charter marks blazing on his sword, sparks flying. But the creature was far stronger. Roman was forced back and then flung down the steps. Swatted like a fly, he disappeared into the shadow as if he had never been. As Roman fell, Clariel swung her falchion two hands to the creature's back. But the steel did not even break that strange blood red skin. It melted as it hit, the metal roiling away in molten drops, as if Clariel had cast a cup of quicksilver against the creature rather than struck it with a finely tempered blade. The creature turned and tilted its head quizzically. Not even a sorcerer's sword, but true. You do not need such things. Let me show you how to find the power within yourself. I will guide you. But first, let me dispose of this small but awesome. It strode over to where Bell lay half in the fire pit, its blade feet striking sparks from the stone as it trod. It raised one of those feet above Bell's head was about to bring it down when Clariel screamed and dived forward, grabbing that unearthly spiked foot with both hands to hold back the killing blow. The moment she touched it, she felt a shock through her whole body, 
The heart raised in panic as some unseen force flowed from the creature into her. It entered her mind, exerting a sudden mental pressure that made her want to let go, to open her hands and let the spike drive down, to help it strike. No, shrieked Clarell. No, I won't let you. It took all her willpower to keep her hands closed and all her strength to stop the spiked foot. Yet despite everything she could do, it kept pressing down, coming closer and closer to Bell's forehead and the charter mark there, as if that was the spot where the young man's skull was thinnest. You are strong, said the voice inside Clarell's head, but not strong enough. <laughs> there's, a little, there's a little sample from Clarell. We'll go to questions in a moment, but shortly before I do that, I might just quickly mention something about the sort of the virtue of persistence, and, and I guess why I'm here today talking talking about my books, um, and also because I, I want to show off an incredibly low tech um, speaking aid, which it amuses me to do in Google. Um, this is the this is my very first book, The Brag Rich. It was published when I was 26. Like a lot of people, I thought when this book came out. It would change my life. It would sell lots and lots and lots of copies and I could just write books and I could give up my day job. But it didn't actually. I mean, it changed my life. It did change my life, but not in the ways that, that I expected, I guess. I thought it would have a much greater and more dramatic change. Because it did okay. It got good reviews, sold a bit, sold out its first print run, but it didn't really do anything. It didn't, I certainly couldn't give up my day job. And after I wrote The Ravage, I wrote another book uh, called The Clearing House, which you will not find in my Wikipedia entry if no one's ever heard of. And after, even after my first novel was published, I couldn't get my next novel published. I couldn't, no one wanted, all publishers thought it was, I thought it was a wonderful idea, everyone else thought it was an incredibly stupid idea, unfortunately. And I could easily have given up at that point, and in fact, I did consider, I thought, oh well, you know, I've written one, it got published, nothing much happened. I've written the second one, you know, it's obviously, it's not going to work. It was a bit like that Monty Python sketch about, you know, I built a castle and sank into the swamp. I built another castle and sank into the swamp. I built a third castle that burned down and sank into the swamp. Um, but no, but he built a fourth castle. And of course, but I did keep going. Partially I kept going because a friend of mine said to me, well, Garth, I guess you're just a one book wonder. <laughs> He's a good friend, amazingly <laughs> enough. And, uh, and I thought to myself, I really don't want to be a one book wonder. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep writing because you never know what can happen. And I did keep writing. And uh, my next book was Sobril. And Sobril actually was also not immediately an enormous success. But it kept on going. It got very good reviews and people liked it. But it was not, not a bestseller. Um, in fact, Sobril by itself has never been on any bestseller lists as it's by itself. Um, but it sold the most copies of any of my books by far. Um, but it's over a long period of time. And the series as a whole has, has been on the bestseller lists. In fact, it's back on the New York Times list Sunday week, which I'm incredibly pleased about. Um, so even then, Sabriel was not an immediate success. I had to keep my day job. Um, but I kept on going. So I could have given up after the rag, which, but I kept going, and I kept, I kept going, and I kept going. I actually Can I get you to hold the other thing? It's very kind of this one. I, I kept going, I kept going. Uh, through through the, the old human books, Shades Children, Keys to the Kingdom, Seven Tower rather, and the Keys to the Kingdom. I kept going, and I kept going, I'm probably called that, and I kept going, <laughs> and I kept going, and I kept going, oh, well, there was a technical difficulty now. And I kept going, and I, <laughs> thank you, Stephen, and I kept going. Normally I just lay this on the floor. And I kept going up to Clarell, of course, the most, the most recent book. I've cheated slightly because you may notice I've used some double covers here and there to make this look even more impressive. But I, I like to think when I look at this this big chain of covers, that you know it could all have stopped back at the Ravage if I if I'd given up. Every book is a new possibility. Every book offers the opportunity for something to happen, and keeping going opens potentially opens new doors. You never know what will happen if you persevere. So I like to I like to show this this whole line of books off because they could easily, have, so easily have stopped early. And the, the other reason I made this is because one day I'm going to take it to my friend who told me I was a wonderful wonder <laughs> and I'm going to strangle him with it. <laughs> of course, that might be too easy for uh, to work out who exactly did it. But um, and, and of course, it's also a very low-tech speaking aid which uh, can work anywhere, so I, I like that. 
I like to show it off. And this is probably a good spot to, to go to questions. Thank you very much. I folded it wrong again. So even though it's low tech, I have difficulties with it. There we go. Thank you very much. So questions? We've got a microphone. I might just grab my, my water. Of course, the, the Australian in the room has to be first. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you collaborated with uh, Sean Williams quite recently. How did that why, I guess, recently rather than before you? Sure. Um, I've written four books with my friend Sean Williams, the Trouble Twisters series. And we're going to write some more. Uh, not a lot of Trouble Twisters, which is complete. We're going to write some other, some other stories. It actually came about because Sean and I have been friends for a very long time. We met at the Brisbane Writers Festival, where we bonded over a disturbing incident in one panel that we we're on, where a, uh, a very uh, unsettled person uh, suddenly started raving in the audience about being captured by aliens, and we were science fiction writers, so it was somehow our fault. Um, and he had a huge green bag, which looked like it was full of guns, um, and we, we were actually quite disturbed. Luckily, he just stopped mid rant and and left, much to the relief of everyone in the audience. So we bonded back then, and we actually have been talking about writing something together for years and years and years, just because it would be fun. Because writing is, is a solitary activity. I mean, you need, to, you need to, to be okay with that. You need to be able to work by yourself on things. But we always, uh, I think many authors like the idea of working with somebody else because it, it would be fun. Um, and we talk about lots and lots of different things. In fact, at different times, have kicked around different ideas. Uh, we, we looked at a couple of screenplay ideas. We looked at some other story ideas uh, before we were at a writers festival together. I think it was in Melbourne, but I can't be absolutely sure. It may have been, may have been a world fantasy convention somewhere entirely not, not in Australia. And I had a very basic idea for a children's story and I was telling him about it, and then he said, well, oh, you could do this, and you could do that. And we started talking about, well, this could happen. And within a two or three hours and a, a few Guinnesses, um, we'd, worked out, we'd worked out the story to, to a basic degree. So we, we decided, yeah, let's write this together. Um, so it really came about because it, we thought it would be fun to write something together, and it has been. It's been a lot of fun. And it makes a nice, it makes a nice change from from just working on our, on, our, on our own books. But that said, I think it's actually very important that we also have our own books and that that, that team writing project is not our total investment, it's not the whole thing, because that, that raises all kinds of other issues, I think, uh, where if, if all your energies, all your identity is fixed in your dual writing team stuff, I think that's that's considerably harder than where it's, it's something you do as well as, as, your, as your other books. And we also, from the very beginning, uh, also worked out how to work, we had a writing agreement in place. Uh, I worked in publishing for a long time in parallel with being a writer. Uh, I was an editor and I was an agent for quite a long time. Uh, I'm still, in fact, um, a shareholder in an agency. Um, so I'm, I'm very aware of how things can go wrong with, with writing duos or, or writing groups. And one of the key principles, of course, is always to make sure that you, know, you have an agreement from the very beginning which sets out how the business will work, um, how, you know, what the shares are, um, who will have the final say if you can't agree on things, both in terms of the writing and in terms of, of the business. So always good to go with your, with your eyes open. Yeah. So I've always been confused about the confusion of princes. It's not a, it's not a collective noun for princes, at it's not a state of princes. So what, what, where did the confusion come from? The confusion of princes, um, I think, comes from that, that's a, a space that's my my space opera novel. I, I love space operas. I wanted to write one. Uh, it's because there are so many princes that they are. Uh, I mean, partly it's just because I really like the title. Um, and it's not. Meant, I, I think it's not meant to have uh, a, literal, a literal interpretation. But in that particular in that, in that universe, there are ten million princes. Uh, so. There can easily be a confusion over any particular prince. Um, there's no specific 
confusion. I also quite like, I think if you have got 10 million princes, I think a confusion would be a collective noun. I think it could become a collective noun if you had 10 million princes. I think that would, that would be fair enough. Um, I hope that, that kind of answers or dodges the question sufficiently <laughs> to, 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 to move on. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. I have a very simple question. You have many, many awesome characters, but my favorite is Oh, Thank you. Do you have a cat? I don't have a cat now. In fact, I, uh, when people ask me about Moggart, um, I always say Moggart is in fact based upon all the cats I've ever known. <laughs> um, whereas the disreputable dog in, in their element of awesome it's very specifically, the dog-like characteristics are very specifically based upon one particular dog. My, my parents' dog, and thus a family dog, called Bitenex. Uh, and Lirel is in fact dedicated to, to Bitenex. Um, so I took very specific dog-like characteristics for the disreputable dog, for one dog in particular, but Moggin is, is all the cats, all the cats. If I grew up, with, we had a cat called Jimmy, for example, when I was a child, uh, and Jimmy, Jimmy probably actually was an influence because he thought he was human. He didn't think he was a cat. He thought he was a human and behaved accordingly. Um, so I'm sure that actually had some, some influence as well into, into the character of Moggart because of course he's not just a cat. Right. You know, he's also an, an elemental power basically. So yeah. I just wondered if it was like, did you ever read that experience with cats? <laughs> 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 well, like, I gotta get this into a book. <laughs> well, I think Seriously, he is, he is all, all the cats. So, you know, Jimmy, my childhood cat, we had a black, we had a black cat we adopted for a while. who was, was very sadly run over. Um, who was completely wild, who would just come in to, to eat every now and again. Um, I used to live, when I first moved to Sydney, there was a neighboring cat and a little kid, well, it was actually a grown cat, but it looked like a kid. It was incredibly cute. And it used to come and visit us. And we worked out much later on it, it visited three or four houses along and be fed in all of the houses. And it also used to smell of wood smoke quite a lot. I, mean, I can never work out, uh, and it was called Little Puss. Little Puss would come in. That's oh, wood smoke. The cat smells of wood smoke. And we, we worked out that's because he spent most of the day lying next to the fire and the neighbors a couple of doors down in the winter. Like so, yeah, well, it, it, cats work out. They, they work out where the best deal is. There they go. Uh, so all those cats, all those cats had an important Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, in Keys to the Kingdom, the mundane setting is the quarantine and the military intervention. And that, that's a very dark focus on um, for the mundane setting, the magic setting. Uh, when inspired that, how come you chose that whole mental quarantine setting for the mundane aspects? Well, I think it's probably more than the mundane aspects. That's a good question. I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure, except that, of course, uh, I'm always influenced by, I get ideas from, from history and from what's happening in the world, what's happening around me, from the natural world. There's all, all these different inputs to you know, the reservoir in my head. And I think probably I was thinking, when I was writing those books around the time, I think the whole bird flu was scared, not before then actually, but I've always been interested in, in uh, I guess I've always been fascinated and afraid of that kind of viral outbreak situation, and so I, want, I just wanted to put it into a book. Um, but I'm not exactly sure why. I often, I don't always know, uh, in fact I generally don't know where ideas come from or why I put things in books, except that it's kind of instinct. I start thinking about something, I think, what could be happening in, in this world, and, and in the case there, what could be happening in Arthur's real world, uh, and I suppose I also wanted to be sort of near future, and that was something that, that came to mind as a as a, a marker of that, perhaps. Um, but but it's really I'm, I'm driven by story. I thought it, it was right for the story. It seemed cool for the story, so um, I I, uh, I wanted to, to put that in. And I, I guess also probably I was thinking about the the impingement of different worlds and how that that would bring diseases and. Uh, you know, going all the way back to the, sort of the commentary theory of where viruses come from and so on, which I, I think is scientifically very unsound, but the stories, it's great, you know, so um, I think that's where, it, that's where it came from. But like everything, almost everything I do, um, it's, it's really, will it work for the story? If it'll make the story work, make the story better, then it stays in. And if I try something and it, it doesn't, then it, it 
it goes out. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi, how are you? Very good. A lot of time has gone by since the person came out, and you've obviously been very busy with many other projects. What inspired you to, you know, come back to the series now? Sure. Um, that's an interesting question because people say to me, what's it like to come back to the old kingdom after 10 years or 11 years? Uh, but to me, I never left because these ideas have been in my head for a very long time. And in fact, Clarial um, stems from a basic question I asked myself when I was writing Lyric. And I, I write, I, I particularly used to write longhand because I write a chapter longhand and then type it up in black and red um, notebooks like this. This is in fact the Mr. Monday notebook. And uh, one of the things I do is I keep track of my word count each time I type a chapter. So I write a longhand type it up. As I type it, I change and correct it. So the first version on the computer would in fact be a second draft. And I keep track of, of uh, the word count and I, and I write the date and so on. So you can see here, Mr. Monday, I started on the 13th of April 2002 and uh, finished on the 10th of September 2002 at 12.55 a.m. <laughs> if you want to know. Um, in fact, it's probably something here about about uh, about the, the viruses and so on. But, um, but I went back and I had a look to see, I remember that I'd written a question to myself about one of the characters in Lirel, uh, which was part of the, the idea for Clarion. And I went back and I had a look, and I saw that I wrote that question in, I think, September 1998. So the, the, the seed of the idea was there from 1998. And like all my books, I spent quite a long time thinking about them before I write them. And because I'm always writing something, I end up having a queue of you know, ideas forming ideas forming up, things where I've written quite a lot of notes which are progressing towards becoming novels, or, or not sometimes, sometimes they're just sitting there in a holding pattern. Um, and then there's the, the big thing which is a crude enough idea mass that I have to land it and get on with it and, and write it. And Clarell was moving up that queue and, and gathering bits and pieces of, of ideas and joining together uh, up until about three or four years ago when I, I decided it was going to be uh, it actually got a formal place in the queue where I said, this is what I'm going to do uh, after the, the book I was then writing. So to me, I was, I was with it the whole time. But of course, to, to readers, um, it's been a long time, for which, for which I apologize for those who, who felt it was too long. Um, but that's just, that's just the, way, the way that I work. So the idea for it, the basic set idea for it is very old. It goes back 16 years. Um, uh, but it's the time to write it where it was formed enough was, was more recent. Yeah. At least you know Isabel Carmody. <laughs> Isabel Carmody is an Australian author who's been writing a series that I think began around the same time as Sabriel, actually. So we're talking, well, in Australia 20, 20 years ago, 20, in fact, she might have been a bit earlier than that, so 22, 23 years ago, and they're still not written the last book. Yeah. Digging in George R. R. Martin to run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should tell him that. Yeah. So I started uh, reading your books with the Seventh Tower books. And those very books sound the keys to the kingdom books you kind of wrote in like at first and haven't really expanded on. Is there just so I guess this is like a two part question. First, um, do you think you'll expand those worlds as well in the future? And second, is, is there like the something about the saber, you know, Lyra world that like compels you to like kind of expand it rather than those things instead? Sure. Um, the Seven Tower books were in fact uh, written, commissioned by Lucasfilm. They own them. Lucasfilm owned the books completely, which means Disney now own the books completely. So there's extremely slim chance I'll ever do anything again with, with those books unless I can somehow rest them back, which is incredibly unlikely, considering who owns them. Uh, so the Seven Tower, I, I, I think that, that is almost almost impossible I would ever go go back to that. Um, the Key to the Kingdom, in my mind, is, is, is complete. It's a complete story. It's a complete big story. That said, I'm always very reluctant to say I definitely won't go back because you never know. Um, I think it's unlikely. I have no, there's nothing in the queue in my head that is related to those to those books, but it, you know, it's a big world. Potentially, I could do something. The, the house is, is is a huge thing. Uh, I could easily find spaces to write stories. 
if the right thing came along, I, I might well do something. So I have no plans at, at present to go back to it. Um, and the second part of the question, is my tired brain quite just managed to hold on to those two questions. That's as much as I can, I can hold in my head. Um, the Old Kingdom, the Old Kingdom and, and Anselstier, the, the, the sort of 1918-ish England analog to, to the south of the wall, they both offer lots and lots of room for stories. And I, I really like going back into, into that world and discovering different things myself because I'm the kind of fantasy writer that I work things out as I go along. I discover the world as I write the story. So I'm not, I'm not one of the writers who works out the whole world beforehand, who plans all the history, the languages, the geography. I just work out what I need and a little bit more as I, as I go along, what I need for the story. I'm very story focused. So for me, going into the Old Kingdom is, is also a voyage of discovery for me writing it. Uh, so I, I always really enjoy that. Um, and in fact, uh, I am writing another one right now, so there will be another Old Kingdom novel, uh, which hopefully will be out the year after next. Again, I'm reluctant to say for sure. It won't be 11 years. Um, much in touch with whatever this material is, <laughs> this opposite. Um, and that book picks up from the end of Abortion and from The Creature in the Case. So it's about, it, it has Nicholas Simplerail in it, uh, but it also connects back to some of the things in Clarendale as well, um, because it's a big world which has a cos cosmology and so on. So there's, there's lots, of, lots of opportunities to, to write stories that connect back in with, with everything that's happened before, uh, in, in some ways, uh, while still being self-contained stories. So I'm writing another Old Kingdom novel. Um, the next Old Kingdom story, in fact, will be out in my next short story collection, which comes out in May, which is called To Hold the Bridge. And it, the, main, the lead story in that is an Old Kingdom novelette called To Hold the Bridge, funnily enough. Um, but it also has stories, it has a story set in the world of Shade's children, uh, called You Won't Feel the Thing, uh, which is possibly the only story completely worked out whilst having a root canal um, <laughs> in an endognathus chair. Um, no pain, I'm glad to say. I mean, I'm really, I'm, I was super impressed with, with modern dentistry that um, you can have, you know, everyone kept telling me about how painful a root canal would be, and I was quite, quite worried about this, but there was no pain, it's just weird. Um, I, I was slightly concerned when the endognathus said to me, looking at the x-rays, my, my tooth. She's looking and she said, you have very, very long roots. They're almost off the bottom of the x-ray. I'm going to have to borrow a longer needle from the vet. <laughs> and she was joking. But just for a moment, I had that, uh, that moment of, oh no, she's got to get a wipe. Um, and that actually sparked off a whole the story. And in fact, that story is about teeth with really, really long roots, which of course, in the world of Shades Children, which is a very much a dystopian, horrendous world, is much, much a much, much more horrible thing uh, than, it, than it is in this current era. Uh, and it also has a story in the Confusion of Princes world too, called Master Her Dad's Holiday, um, as well as lots of other collected short fiction from the last five or six years, which has been published in various anthologies. So the Old Kingdom and Celestia, there's a lot of room, and I've got lots of ideas for stories to write in that world, some of which will be short stories, some will be novels. Um, I, I, you know, I hope I get to write them. And I hope people will keep reading. Thank you. I have two questions, but I'll give them to you one at a time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your consideration. <laughs> the first question is, is there any possibility of a movie coming out about any of your books? Sure. Um, there's been lots of back, backwards and forwards stuff over, over the years. Um, with So Real, I took a particular approach, which um, is possibly possibly a much sort of higher stakes approach in the sense that I wouldn't just sell an option on the book. I wanted to be involved more, more heavily uh, because I wanted you can't ever ensure that it'll be a good film, but don't even tell you how to sell it to, basically. So you know, try and work with, with good people and, and hope for the best. So I went down the path of, of trying to, to find people, put together a, a package of people, uh, which I did back in 2009, and so we did the rounds in, in Hollywood with, uh, it was actually Brad Pitt's company, Plan B, um, and uh, a British director, and I was going to co-write the screenplay with uh, an 
last term from Nomino and Screenwriter. It was a great writer. So it looked it looked great, like we had a, we had a good chance. And we, we did the whole go around the studios thing. It was 2009, and interestingly, almost everybody we met, including the female heads of the studios, had a problem with it being a female protagonist. And there was a lot of, when can the guy come in? You make Touchstone come in on page five. Yeah. When can we bring him in earlier? Um, and ultimately, though it was almost set up, there's a couple of, went on, there's a couple of places it went on to quite a long time, it was like it was going to happen. And then it, it, it didn't. Who knows for what reasons? There's all kinds of different reasons. And then about a year after that, it was actually set up again, pretty much with that same team with another partner. Uh, it was actually going to be shot in Australia using Australian tax credits. And then the Australian dollar went up. And there was a question about whether the tax offset would apply. If the tax offset went away, then $20 million in the budget went away. So the whole thing went away. Um, which is that world. That, that world works like that. Um, I ended up, after, after that, I actually wrote a screenplay for it. It was the guy I was going to write, but ended up running a couple of television shows, being super successful, and had no time. And, but I talked about it enough, and we, I wanted to see do it. I hope that would help move things along. Uh, so there's a screenplay of those rules uh, at different times and different combinations of people who tried to set it up. Um, right at the moment, there's an attempt to set it up again. Um, so, but who knows? Um, it's like a lot of books. Some will never, never get made in films. Some get made in films 30 years later or 50 years later. Um, I would love to see it made. I'd love to see it made by really good people. Out of my control, but I've done everything I can. Um, Shapes Children, people have been trying to set that up for a long time. There's a New Zealand horror movie director who wants to do it. Um, there's, a, there's a guy, actually, a, a Chinese special effects guy who wants to make it in China, which I think would be amazing. Um, but he can't get the money together either. Uh, it's always about the money, ultimately. Um, and they're not, they would not be, they're not um, drawing room comedies you can make very cheaply. Though, though, of course, you can make it more cheaply now than you could at one time. Uh, Keys of the Kingdom has been television people trying to set that up. So I, I have a long history of um, not things not, not working out <laughs> in that regard. I mean, I, I can say that I'm, you know, I'm a successful novelist, but I'm, I'm a very unsuccessful screenwriter because I, I've also written original screenplays that, that I've tried to set up which have not as yet got anywhere. So but fingers crossed, you never know. Um, I hope, I guess one of my one of my daydreams, I guess, is that somebody who loved the books growing up will, will, will is even now becoming a great director whose films I will love and that and will turn out they love my books and they'll be so powerful that uh, the studio will go, Yes, whatever you want to make. You want to make our next table? You loved it when you were twelve. Sure, go for it. And I'll be like, I love their films, this is fantastic. So that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a day trip. It's good to do. It's good to I hope that does work out. Uh, my second question. So I read Sabriel um, at a very young age, and uh, it kind of uh, ruined me. It set the bar so high. And, uh, and so, uh, I'm not sure if I should apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but as obviously a writer of excellent fantasy, um, who do you like to read? Sure. Um, well, I read all kinds. I mean, I, I do read fantasy, but I probably read more other stuff, particularly particularly now. And that's that's just how things have developed, I suppose. I, I do go through periods of, of, of reading fantasy, and trying to sort of catch up, which is impossible, of course. Um, so I read a lot of non-fiction. I read a lot of other kinds of fiction. I read a lot of thrillers and historical novels. Um, I reread a lot. I love rereading. So. Um, but in terms of fantasy, uh, one of my, my big favorite contemporary fantasy writers is Guy Gabriel Kay. Um, I've just reread his uh, River of Stars, which is a wonderful, wonderful novel. Uh, not not with the young adults, but, but it could, you know, the young adults could easily read it, of course. Um, I mean, my books, I think, are not, are not necessarily the young adults either. Um, that's publisher categorization. Not really, it's not really what books are about, it's where it's most convenient to sell them. Um, so, so Guy Gabriel Cave's, almost any of his books, but in, in fact, Under Heaven and River of Stars, I think, it just gets better. It's one of those really annoying people. It just gets better and better. Um, um, I mean, I don't know, good way. Um, so, I, I love 
his fantasy works. Um, uh, Holly Black, I just read her Coldest Girl in Cold Town. I like her stuff a lot. Um, who else have I read recently in, in, in the genre? Um, uh, Maggie Steve Otter's The Scorpio Races, which is really, it's a really good book. Uh, but a very different kind of fantasy. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but I think going back, there's many, not many of the sort of classic fantasy writers I love. Uh, and particularly some of the influences on Sobriel, I, I think. Um, which deserve looking at, like Robin McKinley, the Blue Sword and the Hero and the Crown, I think were a big influence. I'm Ursula Le Guin, of course, um, the Wizard of Earthsea, and the terms of Atuan, perhaps even more so. Um, Susan Cooper, The Dark is Rising, her, her books. Uh, Alan Garner, a British fantasy writer, The Wisdom of Zingerman, which I, I reread often. I mean, and his book, The Owl Service, The Owl Service is such a strange fantasy, it's so powerful. And it's so lyrical. I've often said if I could write anything in halfway as good as the last three pages of the Owl Service, I'd be a very, very happy writer. Um, that, that's the bar really high, I think. That's the bar really, really high. Um, but, but, but there's so many. And what are some of your, your favorites? Uh, you named a couple. Um, I like Diana Wynne Jones. Oh, I love Diana Wynne Jones. Yeah. 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 Although, and in fact, I just read her last, the last book, which her sister finished. Like the islands of Old Chaldea, oh, which okay. Ursula, well, it just came out of Ursula Jones' mission. Very interesting because you can't tell where her sister took over, which I think is sort of testament to both of them. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I love this stuff growing up. I love, I love rereading it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else? Uh, wait, um, of course, Ursula Wynn. Um, Put a Jung spot. You are putting me on spot. I didn't expect this. Whenever I ask these questions, my mind goes completely blank. Even though I've been asked for long, I have to try and think. There's so many. Uh, there, are, there are too many. Lord Alexander, Crimes of Free Day. I mean, again, going back. Um, but there's, there's many fantastic contemporary, contemporary writers as well. Um, there's, there's always so many good books around, old ones, new ones, ones that will come out next week. So, uh, I don't think we're lucky to have such a. There's ones that are not so good as well, of course, but, but uh, there are so many good ones and so much to read. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Earlier this week, we were joined by Nick Spady, who's the founder of National Novel Writing Month, um, yes. in which many people will try and write a novel during yeah. November. I was wondering, with that in mind, if you could talk a little bit about your own writing process and maybe offer some advice for the sure. budding novelists. Sure. Out there. Well, I, I, I think no, Rotten Rhino is a great thing to do. Um, and it seems to help a lot of people uh, break out of uh, some habits and so on and, and find new, new habits. Um, in terms of my, my own writing, I, I wrote half my novels, the first dozen or so of novels that I wrote, I wrote while I had very busy day jobs. Um, and I, I would write just a couple of hours, two nights a week, and I would try and write three or four hours on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I would try and be quite religious about it, and really keep to that schedule. And if you do that in a year or a year and a half, you can write a book. When some writers get up and they say, this is how you write a novel, and it, it, it's how they write a novel how they wrote the last novel. It may not actually apply to you. So I always recommend people take anything a writer says with a grain of salt. It may or may not apply to your own your own writing. Uh, I think it's important to always bear that in mind. So if you do something which is exactly the opposite of what someone has told you to do, that may actually be fine. So whatever works. Um, and try different things. Try, to, try different ways of writing. Um, but I do think finding a routine of some kind is good. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be get up at 4 a.m. and write for two hours. That's the only way. Um, or, or write two two nights a week. It could be. I don't know if you could work it out. Um, but then, since I've been a full-time writer, I flip that around, and I actually write during office hours. I have a separate office. For, for I have two separate offices and at different times. I've also worked at home, and I still work at home to some degree in the spare bedroom in the corner, um, as well as in my in my office. And what I try and do is I don't set myself word count targets, though I do keep track of them um, as a, you know, in this, this like Mr. Monday there, and I will, I will keep track of each chapter as, it's, as, it's, as the first draft is finished, because I do like looking at the numbers going up, this is encouraging. Um, and also one of the things I do is I never tell myself I'm writing a novel. I never tell myself, right, today I sit down and I write a 100,000 word novel. 
because that's a lot of words. I say, I'm going to write a chapter. The chapter is two or three or maybe 4,000. And that's doable. It feels to me that's a discrete task. I won't try and do it all in one go. I'll, and I don't set myself words. Some people say, you got to, I have to do you have to do 1,000 words before you can get up and go down a coffee or whatever. Or, I don't do that. But when I do sit down to write in my, my writing routine, I try and write a sizable chunk of something. And then when I feel like it's time to stop, I make myself do a little bit more. I make myself write a bit more than the first time I decided, oh, I've had enough of this. And I also sometimes do, there's another technique people always recommend, which is never get up when you've finished a chapter or finished a discrete piece of writing, a scene or you know, a, a sequence in a screenplay. Never get up and say, whoa, I've nailed that, and get up straight away and start drinking whatever you do, but actually write a little bit of the next thing. So if you've written a chapter, write the first paragraph of the next chapter, and then get up and do whatever you're going to do. And that, when you come back to it, you've already got something started. You don't have to sort of go, what do I do now? It's already there. It's already started. And you've also done it in the flow of, of, of the momentum you've built up in writing before. So I think that's a little trick that can be very helpful. Um, and I think you know, there are issues of momentum. The more you do, the more you will do. Uh, the more you've written, the faster it gets. Uh, and, and also the other thing I'd say is that I always, I typically really hate my books around about halfway through, sometimes a bit earlier. Um, and this is quite normal. Almost every writer I know, in fact, hates their books at different times. And often it's around the middle. And so I, I will complain to my wife, who, who is a publisher, so it's very unfair have a neurotic author at home, as well as at work. Um, and I'll say, I, I really I hate this book. I, I've forgotten how to write. I don't know, how did I write those other books? Um, I, I, whatever I used to be able to do, I can't do it anymore. It's, it's hopeless. This whole book sucks. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't go on. Um, and then if I'm complaining to her, she'll remind me that I always do this. If she's not around and I'm just doing it myself, I'll, I'll remind myself that I always feel like this. And the only answer to it is to go back and keep going. And typically, it will, you look back and it's not as bad as you think. And also, you can fix it up. Because revision is such an important part of the whole writing process. Even when you've written something that you think is, is great and you're really happy about it, it's always worth going back to it. It's always worth going back to it at some point. I mean, typically what happens is you write something you think it's really terrible and you hate it. Or you think it's really great and you love it. Probably neither of those things is entirely true. <laughs> so it's always important to go back, uh, revise. Sometimes you have to go back a lot. Um, what I often do, another little, another little technique that I do, that uh, again, this may, may or not work, is that I typically will read what I wrote the day before, before I start writing the next thing. And as I'm reading it, I'll also revise it. So my first chapters are typically revised as many times as there are chapters of the book, at least. Uh, so if it's a 35 chapter book, the first chapter will have been revised 35 times. Um, and the last chapter, it won't have been revised only once, but it will have been revised two or three times. And partially that's because the, the momentum builds and I get faster and, and, and more assured and I know the story better and I, the excitement builds up as I, as I get towards the end. So it, it normally, and again, I can look back on my, my record, it's, it's Grim Tuesday in the back, and I can see looking at that that I wrote the I wrote the first it's got twenty three chapters. I wrote the first thirteen chapters in six I wrote the first half in six months and I wrote the second half in five weeks. So uh, momentum builds. So uh, but forcing yourself back back to work, uh, looking at what you've written and then carrying on, always going a little bit further than you think you need to. Uh, all, all those things I think. And I think that alone is a, is a great thing to do. And, and you never know if you can write a novel until you try. And a lot more people, I think, can write them than, than, than and a lot of people think they can't because it's too long. But they never actually try. I think if you try, you never know. And once you've written it, you never know what can happen as well. Every new book is a new opportunity. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Are you doing that, Aaron? Right? Yeah. Good luck. I uh, read Scott Westerfeld's book too, Afterworlds, it's, uh, which is is all about, which is quite new, which is all about writing, writing novels, the first novel, and you know, it's a story, it's a novel, but it's, 
it's in that world writing novels and then I write by itself. So. Yeah, uh, I was just curious where like the inspiration for the names like Savory Lear, Burial, there's clearly a, a theme there, but how, how do you come up with <coughs> names for your characters? Sure. Uh, well, well Sabriel, Clara, Lorel, and so on, they deliberately um, harken back and hopefully resonate with angels' names. They use the Hebrew A-E-L, I-L endings very purposefully. Um, Sabriel, when I was making up that name, I did probably 20 or 30 different combinations of, of different word different word combinations. And what I'm normally looking for is something that resonates in a particular way. Whether you're whether the reader's aware of it or not, it will suggest to them something. And of course, using using those, those uh, Hebrew uh, uh, word components uh, of angels' names actually suggests something mysterious and powerful. It sounds like an angel's name. Angels are mysterious and powerful. These connections are made inside your head. Uh, and you may or may not be, be, be aware of it. So that, that's a very deliberate choice. But I, I spend a lot of time combining different pieces of words to make names that not only have the right resonance, but also sound right. So I'll say them aloud a lot until I find a name that works for me and that feels right. It feels like it carries the, the right sort of weight for who the character will, will be. So that, that's how I, how I make up the names. But I also, you know, I, I steal names. Um, Abhorson comes from Shakespeare. Uh, Abhorson, in Measure for Measure, is an executioner. And when I was looking for the name of the family, uh, Sabre's family, and I wanted, I wanted an executioner's name, I was looking back through history and myth, and looking for different names of famous executioners, and I couldn't find one that worked for me. And then quite accidentally, um, I was reading Measure for Measure, there was the Orson, an executioner, and I thought, there's the name. Shakespeare stole names, I can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Or are we, we're all done. Thank you very much. Thank you.